Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to wrap up this week's theme with, I think, honestly, one of the longest band names I've ever seen. Colloquially known as Ex Imperatus, the full name is Ex Imperatus Urkethzebibsiptagakathsoveliarzakalalum or something like that. Uh, its name, and presumably also the song titles, it states is scribed in dead languages of the ancient East, and appears to be a spell of anti-cosmic lords that reign in the darkest spheres of non-existence. Right. So, it... it this band, I think, also gets the title of Longest Song Names. In fact, this one right here is quite lengthy. It's everything that's highlighted there and is frequently truncated, having only the first hundred or so uh, characters and then an ellipsis after that, the good old dot dot dot, to tell you that there is more. Interestingly, this is the title on Bandcamp and YouTube. However, on Spotify, it is called Concerning the Questions of Contemplating Cognition of Tragedy Inception... Dot, dot, dot. Presumably, this is a translation of that right there. And then I happened to land on this nice picture here, which seems to continue this. It says, concerning the questions of contemplating cognition of tragedy inception and the inevitable destruction of matter in the annihilation doctrine like prime elements of true nature of the ascetic prolegmenia or intergalactic grief of Schopenhauer's death proving wisdom, forging with the apocatastic flame of heterodox catharsis of the artery of metaphysical syllogisms into the blade of Luciferian mind of a casual volunteerism turned into ashes the solar ziggurats of the last dawn and the forthcoming yugov of Nietzscheanity. Yeah, that's... that's a song title. So, uh... In an interesting twist, despite all of the lengthiness going on, the song is less than three minutes long. <laughs> I don't begin to understand anything that's going on with this project, but I hope you have appreciated the lengths I have gone to to explore the lengths of the titling of the project and the song and the album and, I mean, pretty much just everything. Everything about them is just so extra. And honestly, I kind of dig it. I don't know if I'm going to dig the music based on that uh, album art. I'm not. But this intro has gone on long enough. Let's dive into this and see what Ex Imperatus is bringing to the table today. I like how the riff bounces between the two guitars. Big atmosphere. That snare. Everything, even the guitars, just on this rhythm.
That's a really fun riff, though. Interesting to hear that smaller sound get expanded out into this section. kicks oh jeez yeah my intro to this reaction was even longer than the song itself that's pretty bad i mean not really not <laughs> it's not that it's bad and that it's not good it's just uh very unusual I don't usually have to spend so much time uh, providing introduction work. It's I think that's more what it's about, how lengthy the introduction was more so than how short the song was. Because we've listened to shorter stuff. I think we've listened to a four-second song before. I don't remember the band, but I'm pretty sure it was called You Suffer. So, I mean, this is, this is an epic compared to that. <laughs> uh, let's see, where do we start with this? Is Death Metal. We have a really low, unintelligible growl. I don't think it's in English to begin with, so I'm not. I wasn't going to pick up any of it regardless. But I certainly can barely even make out syllables with the the production on it and the vocal delivery and just the lack of raw enunciation, or I guess the lack of purposeful enunciation is a bit of a raw raw side of uh, speech delivery. Um, and it's just, you know, covered up with a ton of compression, natural compression, a little bit in the production, I'd assume as well. Um, and it just, especially too, when everything's playing, it gets stuck, you know, under all the instruments, especially, interestingly, the drums. I think I wanted to save this a little bit later in the, in the analysis here, but that was a really good segue. The drums are loud, man. They, they're just... They overshadow everything. This was something I picked up on uh, about halfway through the track. I'm used to hearing vocals, especially in death metal, kind of get stuffed into the mix a little bit, not be anywhere near as prominent as uh, you know popular styles of metal like metalcore or pop music or radio rock, stuff that elevates the vocals, usually way above the band. I think sometimes even too far, but you definitely, much like stuffing it into the mix, you, you develop an ear for it over time. Um... But it's very odd for me to hear the guitars stuffed into the mix and give such prominence to the drum work. I think it's because there's a lot of extremity to this. This is a very extreme type of death metal. We've listened to death metal in the past that I've have jammed with. We've listened to some extreme tech death in the past that I've jammed with. This is a very raw type of death metal, both in composition and in production. And it reminds me a little bit of black metal. And I wonder how much of that plays into some of this. Um, but even with black metal, where the guitars are kind of, uh, everything's kind of pushed into the mix a bit, the drums tend to be hyper re reduced as far as their presence. You know, bass kicks are this this muffled thud that you really have to listen for, that kind of stuff. So this kind of goes in the opposite direction of that in a way that I wouldn't expect really from any of the contexts that I have for this type of music. And it uh, just really stood out to me, especially that snare. It's, it's more prominent, it has more body, it has more presence than pretty much everything in 
the the band it is a very unique decision i think it does give the song a very visceral feeling though the song feels physical there's an aggression to the drum work it is never light it is never melodic it is full force constant attacks all the time i don't usually use this type of metaphor but the dude is beating the crap out of these drums it's also the most prominent sound and timbre of the mix and it gives the song overall this this raw physicality a brutality almost to it because this is the most prominent sound this violence of striking a drum head to craft or, or to achieve this imagery i think validates the decision to put the drums so far up but i think on a casual listening i'm not a real big fan of it i i appreciate the artistic purpose of it but i would not want to listen to a full album of this and i'm quite appreciative of somebody giving me a three minute song um well they didn't really have much of a choice did they <laughs> I went and checked. I honestly figured this would be one of their shorter ones, and it's not even the shortest on the album, but all the songs on the album sort of sit around that three-minute mark, a little less, a little more. There's a couple in the fours. There's one in the five. It just barely breaks into its 505. So, yeah, I mean, pretty much anything I got was going to be on the shorter side, which is just bizarre, again, given the length of lengths that they put into their band name the the album title the song titles and then they put together these quick little songs um but i do appreciate the shorter length because of that i think i feel like this is a really good runtime for me to be exposed to this type of production and this honestly this this sonic brutality and a lot of that comes from the way that the drums are performed and mixed And this brings us to the last instrument, the guitar. There's two of them, uh, three tracks at one point in time, but something tells me that there's probably only two guitars, just because three guitars is a bit rarer. There's probably a bassist in here. I heard no bass, though. Uh, part of it, I think, could also just be I wasn't particularly listening for it. Three minutes is not a long time to spend with something, and we did go through quite a few sections, and usually the way that I approached my, my orchestral listening, my active listening, is starting with drums, not because that's necessarily where I want it to be, it's just, it draws the attention, it does something new, and my mind immediately says, hey, that's, you know, we need to go check that out, um, just because it's so loud. And then vocals, and then finally guitars, and I, by the time I get to what the bass is doing, trying to hear the bass timbre, we've moved on to something else, and my brain's like, oh, time to reset. So, there might be bass in here. It is not very prominent in the mix at all. There was never any point where I thought, hey, you know, the bass is doing something cool here. Let's, you know, let's key in and, and check it out. I don't remember hearing any, which is not atypical for death metal, and even a lot of more extreme metals in general. This is from 2016, where at least I feel like bass is becoming to make a bit of a comeback after the big bass erasure of the 90s. <laughs> I don't know if that's a real thing, but I think we could start calling it that. Uh, the 90s certainly um, deprioritized bass prominence in metal production, and we saw a lot of bands replicate that sound, unfortunately. Um, but there's, it's, it's had a revival in the 2000s, and I think by the 2010s, we've begun to see it more prominently mixed, which I always really appreciate of, as I love the bass. Um, but I couldn't hear any in here, which just feels like, you know, it's one of those metal production styles. It's a part of metal history. It's, metal bands still replicate it. It's not my favorite type of production or mix, but it is what it is. Maybe on a second time through, if I focus predominantly on it, I might hear some bass, but 
I, I didn't hear, so I can't comment on it. But as for the guitars, very riff heavy, uh, very rule of cool pentatonic riff heavy, focusing more on ideas that have this aggressive edge to them, more so than ideas that are melodically sound or d designed to do anything that pushes the song forward in any melodic or harmonic manner. In fact, I honestly don't remember any chord progression going on in here either. There is, of course, chordal ideas present. All you have to do is take all the notes that are being played in a riff, and you can get the general idea of a chord through that. But I don't believe that there was any moment when anybody was playing chordal work. And since I didn't hear the bass, the bass might have been doing pedal tone stuff, so I might have been able to get some information out of that, knowing what the root tone of our chords were. But without that, I don't really hear a chord progression either, because many of the riffs, the phrasing is to take one riff and just repeat it over and over, which gives us a stagnancy of harmony. So... Yeah, a lot of it's just, does this sound cool? Let's do it. Uh, there was one riff that I really liked. Uh, it was a lot of pedal tone writing um, that was also palm muted. So it creates this bass line, sort of rhythmic. It was fast, 16th notes, uh, sort of like machine gun fire going off. And then it almost felt like slowly letting off the palm mute. So you're not just instantly going to uh, allowing the notes to ring out. It's this gradual shift to a full ring and then a gradual shift back. There's also a volume swell that went with it. Some of this probably, you know, we have volume pedals that help us with some of this stuff. I don't know how they went about producing it, but they also went from this pedal tone arpeggiated up to a peak, arpeggiated back down with this general swell. So as the notes begin to ring out more, as they begin to get louder, they also are rising in pitch. And inversely so, when we bring the volume back down, when it swells back down, when we begin to mute more of it, we also bring the notes back down. We have a reduction in pitch. And it happens so fast though. And then we also have harmony on it where both guitars are not playing the same notes, but I think are pretty consistent in their distance of notes. I don't know what that distance was. It had quite a bit of tension to it. Uh, it, was, it was a bit, uh, what's that word I like to use for it? I don't know. It was just a very tense dyad that was being played, which makes me think of fourths, but it didn't really carry that, uh, that Baroque feeling, fourths in metal. Uh, tend to feel very classical to me and they didn't hear. So I'd like to uh, get some sheet music and see exactly what they're doing with the dyads at that point. It was like a minute 45 in. Uh, it was definitely in the back half of the track. But the whole riff was cool. It's one of those moments that I was like, yeah, I can get behind this rule of cool thing. I have a tough time connecting with, you know, just riffage. You know, Bolt Thrower is a band, every time I check them out, I see the comments, these guys are the king of riffs, they're so good, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's a good song, but I I, I just, there are some riffs, uh, most riffs, I'd say, I just, I don't get it, I don't get the, the riff culture, I suppose, I don't know if I'll ever get it, but there are certainly some riffs that will click with me, and that was one of them, I really love that, and it was just, it's a lot of things. It's not just the riff itself, it's how it was played. And it's also the contrast of everything else. It has this wide sweeping arc. We went up about an octave and a quarter, I would say, uh, then come back down to the root tone and then stick with that root tone for a while. It's the contrast between the stationary and the wide jumps, the acrobatic and the stationary. I'll just use that word again. Um, but also how it contrasts against the other riffs, which tend to be a bit more rhythmic and textual than focusing on pitch of any sort. And so, I don't know, it just, it was one of those moments where it stands out against everything else and it was also cool and it was also doing its own thing and it also had contrast within itself. It was just, it, I guess it ticks all the right boxes for me. And so, uh, yeah, like I said, Riffs aren't always my thing, but sometimes they click with me, and that was one of them. That was just such a, a classy little lick there. 
Um, the last thing I think I want to touch on is just rhythm in general. There's a lot of 16th note ideas in here. Uh, we have really tight, um, like four 16th notes uh, on the bass kicks. Uh, they're used to sort of punctuate and accentuate riffs and ideas all throughout the track. There is uh, a lot of sections where we just have a very rigid, constant 16th note drive going on somewhere. Uh, we have those really fast 8th note snare hits. Rigid rhythm is, yeah, that's how this song operates. Sometimes it uses the rigidity against, um, it's not really syncopated. But you'll have the consistency of just like do 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 just that constant sixteenth note drive somewhere, and then you'll have another instrument who does pockets of like two or four, and then rest, and then you know another pocket of those really fast notes, and so we have this consistency versus this on-off switch almost, and that can create a groove. The separation, the schism between those two ideas, even though they're both using this very rigid rhythmic idea. I found those to be rather neat and like I said, an introduction of groove. Some it's not heavy syncopation, but it's light enough syncopation to create some sort of groove within this just pure rigid sounds. Um, but then it, we would also juxtapose that with something like uh, like fifty seconds in when every single instrument was just doing this constant eighth note and it was just this lumbering continuous moment or movement that just wasn't ending, just this forward pace, uh, like an unstoppable train, just constantly going, not speeding up, not slowing down, just constant, consistent momentum. Um, and again, that contrast is really nice. So rhythm is used sparingly, but interestingly across this in order to keep some sort of pacing going forward. And even speaking about pacing, I mean, it's less than three minutes long. Even if it stuck with one idea, I don't think it would have outlasted its its stay unless it was just such an, um, you know, not an egregious, but an, an annoying sound, possibly, which is subjective, right? But uh, it, I think it would really have to grade on you for one idea to feel like it's lasted too long in a song that's as short as this. The fact that they get through so many ideas and that there is so much contrast in this track really speaks to the pacing of the song feeling as quick as it is. Really, we didn't last in anything too long and it does feel like we went through things at quite a fast speed and it made the song feel like it was over before I even thought about it. But it does end on a nice note. It's not like the ending comes out of nowhere. It's a nice lead into it and then a very, uh, you know, direct stop that feels like it naturally landed there. It doesn't feel like the song just ends slamming into a wall or anything. You know, in an interesting twist, despite all the extremities that are present here in this extreme style of metal, it's, it's kind of tastefully done. <laughs> That's a weird word, I think, for something like this, but it is tasteful death metal in a lot of ways. It goes out of its way to do a lot of things that I don't think other death metal bands do who put more time into their, their music. These, these guys accomplish in three minutes what I think some death metal bands fail to do in five and six minute songs. It's... It's kind of impressive. It's nothing, again, that I would really want to dig into. Um, it's, it's really not my cup of tea. But it is impressive in a lot of ways the more I begin to think about it. I'm going to see what I can do with the lyrics. If it is the combination of dead languages, as they stated, it might not have any actual translation to it, but I got to check anyways, just for completionist sake. Yeah, and the lyrics are present. I found them on Bandcamp. That seems to be fairly official. Genius also has them, and they seem to be in line with that. Metal Archives as well have them, but anytime I try to translate them, no translator can do. I did find a website called uh, Lyric 
tran lyricstranslate.com they have a couple of translated songs but none off of this album and certainly not the track we checked out so unfortunately we can't do a lyrical dive on this one but i hope that the musical analysis was good enough for some of y'all to uh make this video interesting <laughs> uh, and worthwhile watch those are my thoughts on uh, Ex Imperatus's concerning the questions of contemplating yada yada yada. I'm not going to say it all again. <laughs> what are your thoughts though? Did you enjoy this? Was there anything that stood out to you? Anything you'd like to add on to what I said or correct me on? Also, if you just have your own thoughts, opinions, or perspectives about this track. If you have any insight into the lyrics, maybe you know of a super secret website that has translated them. You can put all that stuff down in the in the lyrics section, in the comments section of the video. Above that, in the description box, you can find a link to Linktree. It takes you here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. We do have another video today, and I still don't know what it is. I have to go look that up before I start recording the next video. Um, but it's it's probably going to be interesting. Most of the stuff on the channel is interesting, if nothing else. Go ahead and check that out. Otherwise, I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC. As usual, we're going to check out a full album. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos.